All right, and so for our last session uh, of the day and of the conference, uh, and this is something new we're trying this year, is having an end note. Um, I reached out to um, Dr. Jeff Welser. He's the uh, director of IBM Abedin Research, um, and asked him if he could come up and give a talk about um, not only IBM's uh, you know, vision for computing of the future, but just his uh, own personal insight on uh, where we're heading uh, with computing and, and other areas. So, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, so um, this will be a little bit more broad ranging maybe than uh, the other talks. Um, I don't, I'm actually specifically not talking a lot about HPC at all, because I'm assuming that you guys in the room probably have at least as good an insight. I'm sorry. Oh, that's all right. Um, have at least as good insight as I do in terms of where HPC is going in the future. But instead I want to talk a little bit more about um, what we just think about from the sort of applications um, and uh, our client side and where we see computing going uh, from a research perspective. So this is mostly looking forward out. Um, so I am uh, director of the Almond Research Lab uh, in California. IBM uh, still has a research division, uh, a quite robust one, 3,000 researchers globally. Uh, Yorktown Heights in New York is, is, uh, is our headquarters. Um, we actually are still vertically integrated as well, and that's important because you'll hear me talk about sort of all layers of the stack here. So we have people in my lab who are literally moving individual atoms around, trying to see how few it takes to store a bit. And for magnetics right now, it's about 12 atoms, so we have a little ways to go on that. Um, all the way up through big systems, big storage systems, exascale for HPC, uh, cognitive computing and analytics, um, AI, and increasingly uh, industry expertise. So literally having uh, researchers who have PhDs in finance or medical doctors or, or chemists and geneticists because computing is becoming more and more uh, industry specific, domain specific. It's less about selling you a you know, big system uh, to go in your back office and run your payroll and more about trying to figure out ways to actually help you in your research, help you in your marketing, help you in your actual uh, industry domain. So actually even at the research level, thinking about what that means uh, for systems, particularly learning systems, AI systems is, is important. Um, we are organized not like a university or research site in terms of we aren't, don't have like the computer science department, the material science department, et cetera, but rather we're organized in sort of four strategy areas. And this is also mirroring sort of the change uh, that we're seeing in the industry. You know, up until about five years ago, we really were very academically uh, oriented. So we still have a science technology group, um, and they are the physicists and the chemists. They are still mostly grouped the way you find them at the university. They still work on the building blocks uh, upon which we hope to build. Um, then we have two different groups that look at our computational roadmaps. One is computing as a service, which is, you can think of cloud computing, but in, in reality it really is sort of continuing the line of what we think of as computing. Von Neumann architectures, HPC, high-end servers, um, continuing the Moore's Law roadmap, et cetera. Uh, but now with the thought of having the software and hardware engineers working together from the beginning, because in the end, we might not ever sell you a piece of hardware or a software package, but instead might just sell you a service. So I don't want the researchers optimizing every bit of hardware or software. I want them optimizing the computation that comes out. Uh, so thinking about that even again at the research level we think is, is important. We also then split off something we call cognitive computing, which is really focused on where we see sort of a parallel um, a path almost going, which is all about artificial intelligence, machine learning, doing things the brain does really well that our current systems actually don't do all that well. Um, you know, despite the fact we're getting really good with accelerators uh, and things like that, the reality is the architecture we use is not really the architecture that's made for these sorts of problems. So uh, that's the reason for actually separating that group off. Um, so I think about the future of computing. Uh, technology always has been about augmenting human capabilities, right? So it, even from the very beginning, we start to get machines. It's about communicating further than a person can communicate or seeing farther than a person can see. Um, and that's also true, of course, in the current age. Uh, and it's always been really about now doing computations faster and faster and more accurately than a person could do them on larger scales than a person could do them. And increasingly, of course, even giving it to you so you can take it out with you uh, as you're walking around and not just necessarily sitting in your laboratory. So the questions as we think about the future of computing are what are the things that humans need help dealing with now that they maybe can do pretty well at a small scale but can't do as well at the scales that are coming in the future? And, and that really is all about data, right? That I think has been the, the biggest change or explosion uh, that's been happening that has changed the face of what we think of when we think about building computing systems. 
You've probably all seen some version of this chart along the way in terms of how data is exploding. The UR here line you can see. Um, the scale on that I finally took off because I kept having to increase it, but it's on the order of about 50 zettabytes is the uh, estimate right now for 2020. And that's uh, 21 zeros if you want to write it out and see how big it really looks on paper. Um, but you can see that the, the biggest change is also the nature of the data. So that, that dark uh, brown, the dark blue at the bottom is the enterprise data. So that's structured data in databases. That was really the majority of all data that we really dealt with for, for decades during the computing times. It's fairly, it's structured, it's fairly accurate in most cases. There could obviously be errors in it. Um, and it's highly controlled. It's also highly siloed, which can be a good or a bad thing. Um, but the data growth really is coming now in other areas. So voice over IP, social media is huge, um, sensors and devices, IoT. A lot of the reason that that's so large is a lot of it is not text data or number data, of course, but it's uh, visual data, it's images, it's video, et cetera. So that growth in data is, of course, an opportunity, right? So what can we do with that data now? Um, the challenge is, of course, it's not structured, it's not accurate. Um, you know, if I say that's accurate, how accurate is your average tweet that you read? Well. Washington DC aside, even there it's not very accurate anymore. So uh, in the end, you have to take data you know is inaccurate um, and somehow come up with actionable decisions that hopefully will have value for you. Um, and so that's really the, the challenge that we see. And that's something the brain is pretty good at, right? So what we want to do is augment the brain's ability to deal with um, uncertainty, to deal with lots of different types of sensory inputs coming in, um, and be able to drive insights from it and deal with it fuzzily. I don't need 64-bit you know, accuracy uh, to determine uh, what I want to do with that tweet, but I do have to have a really good understanding of how to pull information together from different areas to actually go do something with that. Um, and I think that's one of the interesting things, too, is it's not just the capabilities for um, each specific function, but it's getting the domain knowledge into the system, too, because what you're reading or looking at is so dependent on what area you actually are trying to do. If you're trying to read a medical text versus reading a physics text, um, if you're an expert in finance versus an expert in marketing, um, your knowledge and your way of looking at information is so different than the other person's. How do you get systems that can do it that well, too? Um, our belief is we're far from being, having the, the big AI, right? You know, the artificial intelligence that's the all-knowing, all-capable. All so we really do want to kind of divide it up into these sort of domains. Um, so obviously the first sort of you know, big foray into this, at least for IBM, but I think you know, even for, for many, many people outside of IBM, was the Jeopardy game uh, back in uh, 2011, I guess, at this point, uh, where a machine, Watson, was able to beat uh, the two champions in um, something we actually thought as humans we had a lock on, which was understanding language, uh, riddles, puns, um, and general language uh, uh, processing um, question answer. And it was very impressive. I think even, even internally, we were surprised when it worked. It was a bit of a risk to go out when we did with it, because um, it wasn't like we were winning like every time in the, in the background. It just you know, all worked out at the right time. But it was because we had realized we reached sort of a critical mass of enough computing power, enough different types of algorithms for looking at natural language processing, not one that works perfectly, but if you use a whole bunch of them and you kind of average the results, you can get some feeling that you, if they're all giving you the same answer. You probably know the answer, so you buzz. If they are giving you all different answers, you probably don't understand the question, so you don't buzz. So having that kind of capability all together made it feasible to go and do it. So it comes off looking like a very intelligent thing. Of course, in the end, it's, it was very much a, a, a brute force um, application of, of known algorithms and things around uh, natural language processing. Um, and, and by the way, it was running in a room about half the size of this on a system that was 80 kilowatts and had 15 terabytes of RAM in it. Um, so clearly larger than the brain that was sitting there, you know, two liters, 20 watts, something like that. So you could say right there, we're doing something wrong with the architecture, if that's, that's what it takes to beat those guys. Uh, so I think that's really what also made us realize it's not going to be just the algorithms and analytics. It's going to be thinking about how you actually build systems that go and do this. Um, so, that whole system, as impressive as it was, basically did one thing, question and answer, which is arguably just one step better than search. So you type something into Google, you get a bunch of lists back of, of potential things that might be of interest to you. This goes one step further and tries to find the answer and, and construct it for you to say, here's probably what, you, you, what you're asking, here's your answer back. Um, but it's still going after something where the answer is in the data. It's just a question of finding it and putting it together. That's only a very small part of what, of course, intelligence is or what we do every day. So we've been building over time lots of different components that are in the sort of cognitive space or in the AI space. 
And it's important to note that you know, these use very different techniques. Some use fairly standard um, uh, linear regression statistical techniques. Uh, some use some machine learning in sort of the classical sense. Some use deep learning and, and various algorithms in different types of structures that way. And, and really tailoring the approach has been very important for each of these. And, and again, we're seeing these as components. And of course, we're continuing to work on other components along the way. Um, and these are all things, if you think about it, that you kind of, your brain can do. It doesn't think about it this way. It doesn't think it's doing these things. But it's putting all these together to answer the problem. Um, and we think this is the way to at least make progress towards getting things that are more and more intelligent. So something that's a visual recognition or being able to do um, entity resolution or being able to do text extractions. So these are all just components that have, can be optimized. And then a person can pull those together, pull the APIs together, for example, and actually then build the function they're actually looking to do. Um, and, and the other thing that we're doing here that's different than at least IBM in the past would have done, um, all these things are available out on the Watson Developer Cloud or the Bluemix Cloud, and we encourage and have people coming in to use them externally to go play with them, um, you know, for initially for free, and of course, if they then go build a commercial service from it, there's, there's fees associated with it. But it's because we realize that in this world, we can't hope to actually sell every cognitive solution for every industry domain out there. There's just, there's just too much specialization. You know, again, it's not like I'm just selling you a big server and a big database that I can sell it to every industry in the world. I gotta make a really clear uh, solution which could take a lot of R&D for that one problem you've got in healthcare or that one problem you've got in marketing. So we ourselves are working in some large spaces. Um, health is one that we are putting a lot of money into building our own solutions on. Genomics, the same thing. But for example, we aren't going to go into the veterinary space most likely. But there are people, startups on our platform using these to build similar solutions for personalized healthcare for your cat or your dog when they go in, um, which is a, a perfectly valid market. And we want to actually learn what they're learning from that because we might use it in the health side and they can learn what we're learning from our side. So it's a very different type of interaction um, around building these solutions than, than we've seen at least in the past. Just some examples of, of areas and the diversity of, of data and things that we think about. Um, we talk about reading natural language processing, and that's, of course, one of the things that we focus a lot on. But reading, is, reading documents is very specific to the domain. So we were thinking about how you could help R&D groups or researchers. We started with the pharma industry because it's an area where um, the research model is quite broken. Uh, 12 to 15 years to bring a drug to market, usually costing over a billion dollars. They have a 90% fallout rate on this along the process. Obviously, you hope he falls out in the early part of that 12 to 15 years and not in the late part. But of course, unfortunately, that's not always the case. So how can you make this more efficient? Um, and the, the reality is there's huge numbers of publications out there, 50 million publications right now and more coming out constantly. A researcher in that field is constantly reading all those, as many of those publications as he or she can to get ideas about what molecule they should be looking at, what they should be worried about with the molecule they are looking at, that in fact, somebody else has tested and found out it becomes toxic. Um, but they can only read a few dozen papers at a time. If a system could read all of them and then reread them every week or so as they come out, and could read them the way the researcher was reading them, that could be a huge help for, for that researcher. But the, the challenge we found when we started to do this was um, you know, the very first thing you have to teach the system is what is a molecule? Um, and it turns out a molecule in most of the drug world has 50 to 100 different synonyms in many cases. Brand names, generic names, different ways of doing chemical strings. In fact, so many that there's no human who actually knows all 50 or 100 for any given molecule. But a human expert in reading a paper would know that word is the same molecule, even if they hadn't seen that word before, from context. They can read around it, they understand what they're reading, and they say, oh, yep, that must just be another word for that same molecule that I've, I've known in the past. How do you get the system to be able to go do that? Because you can't just give it the dictionary of these words are all the same molecule. Um, so that's, that was a challenge. That's a lot of machine learning, a lot of understanding the domain. Once you teach it what a molecule is, then you want to teach it that, you know, if this molecule has this chemical structure, that molecule is a similar molecule. Um, maybe moving one carbon atom makes a big difference or a little difference, and that, again, is a chemical knowledge. Teaching the system that so it can then say, oh, well, now I'm going to look for all the papers that have that molecule in it and tell you about those studies has been the challenge along this. But it's interesting because we are finding you can do this, but you do it very carefully working with the industry experts and they, they use the, the system, they give it queries, sometimes they get really good results back and we feel really proud, sometimes they get garbage back and you feel really dumb. So that, that's a very iterative process over time. 
Um, images, another area that's very big. Uh, we actually just demonstrated this at um, a radiological conference uh, last November, uh, RSNA, which is uh, about a 65,000 person conference, a huge number of radiologists come. The idea here is, can you build an assistant to help a radiologist uh, do his or her job? Um, and the, the real challenge in radiology is just the sheer number of images coming out. So when you go in for an MRI scan, on the average of 10,000 images gets produced, and of course then that radiologist, first of all, by law, they have to look through all of them, or at least scan through all of them, and then they've got to, because liability, the lawyers are always in the background, um, and they want to find really the 10 or 20 that really matter, right, that it's going to help them with the diagnosis. Um, so if the system could go through and return, here's 20 that are pretty important, look at these first, that would be a huge help for productivity, as well as reducing error rate, right, there's less chance they're going to miss that important thing. But it turns out in order to do that, not only do you have to be really good at the image analysis, um, you have to actually, under, the, the system has to understand the patient the same way the radiologist does. So it has to be able to read the electronic medical record, the test results, understand the diagnoses that have happened in the past, because without that knowledge, its ability to say that that blip on the, on the, radio, uh, on the MRI scan is important or not is very limited. It becomes very much just an image recognition and, and turns out that's not very accurate. Uh, so that's exactly what that we've done. So it's interesting seeing at the, the conference uh, the radiologist playing with it, because we had some cases of them just go through and play, and we'd show the reasoning the system was going through, um, which was also very important to these systems. You know, neural nets tend to be black boxes in many cases, and, and that's really, first of all, just a bad thing in general if, if you want to try to improve them. But it's also, even from a legal standpoint or an understanding standpoint, important that we don't just treat it as a black box. So as this is going through, it's showing you the reasoning why it's narrowing down certain diagnoses. At any point when you click on an image, it'll say, oh, you like that image? Well, here's the 20 others that are related to that that I also found that maybe you should look at too. So the ability to have the system interact uh, with the human uh, is really important if you want it to be useful and to make sure it actually does lead to better results in the end and not results that we don't understand what, what's coming out from it. Um, and lastly, uh, the field of genomics is another area of exploding data. Um, obviously, we've, we've heard about genomics for personalized medicine. You know, I want to treat your tumor, your cancer for the exact mutation you've got, the ge exact mu genetic mutation we're seeing there. Um, and we're doing a lot of research on that uh, back in New York. In our lab, though, we actually are looking at a slightly different problem, which is um, what if instead of trying to sequence an individual's DNA or a tumor's DNA, what if I just took a sample of something, uh, in this case a raw food product, um, and just took the whole thing, slurried it up, and sequenced every bit of DNA and RNA that's in there. And I'm not going to get any complete genome from that, but I can, if I then do a, a big data problem, figure out every bacteria, every virus, every fungus, every microbe that has any DNA and RNA in that sample and identify what the, the population looks like there. The, the microbiome, which I'm, you probably have heard that term. And, you know, we have microbiomes ourselves. You know, we're covered with bacteria. It turns out they're you know, mostly, of course, not only not bad for us, in many cases they're, they're critical to our health. And I think that's going to be a really interesting uh, uh, study for human health in the future. Uh, similar in food, you know, all bacteria is covered with, all foods covered with bacteria, most of it's benign, some of it's not. Um, how can the food industry then maybe use this uh, to actually help itself in food safety? And so we're actually partnered with the Mars Corporation on this, because um, their biggest fear is they do a lot of testing today for all the microbes, but they only test for the things they know they're supposed to be looking for. Um, and you, if something else is put in there that you didn't know you were supposed to look for, how are you going to know? So the idea is using the microbiome, if that, if you're doing, say, the chicken meal that comes into the factory every day and it's got a certain ecology to it, and one day you test it, well, if you test it and you see salmonella, then obviously you know you've got a problem, but that you know anyway. But what if all the bacteria populations just suddenly shift? So suddenly you have a lot more of one bacteria and a lot less of another. All benign, but why did they all shift all of a sudden? So that gives you headlights that something is different here. Something is different with this sample, and maybe you can go test further beyond before you put that into your factory and contaminate things, or, or worse, have it get out the door and hurt, um, hurt pets or people in the future. Um, so that, that's sort of the idea behind it. But that's, a, as you can imagine, a huge data problem because you're dealing with just a slurry now of DNA and RNA and matching the databases around the world. So this is why we actually, we think about the future of computing. We actually think it's all about completely inverting the way we, we build systems and starting with data. You know, data itself is huge. It has mass. And in our, our minds, we say, well, if it's got mass, it's got gravity, and it's distorting everything we're doing with computing these days. And three specific things that, that, that we are finding, our, that we change with our systems. One is that the compute itself increasingly has to move to where the data is, rather than assuming that you're going to just load data into your system. 
Um, it turns out that uh, the data curation is actually the most important part of this. How do you get data in a form you can actually use? I have to say that the talk just prior to mine was a, a great example of just having data from lots of different places that's noisy, that you can't match up because it's not in the same format. Even the way you do location, whether it's address versus you know, GPS versus some you know, census geo block, that's, that's a huge problem to get those all normalized before you can even start doing the interesting work, which is what you wanted to go do next. Um, so data curation is a huge issue. And lastly, um, the, a lot of the data is at the edge, right? It's actually not in data centers. It's actually in sensor devices or in our mobile devices and things around us. So that, that also changes how we build things. So looking at each of those, and the first, um, you know, when we say that data has, the queue has to move to where the data is, it's not just the edge problem, which we'll get to. That's, that's fascinating. But it's even in the cloud. We always talk about the data being in the cloud, but we all know there is no cloud. There's not just one cloud up there where we've got all our data neatly waiting for us. There's all sorts of different clouds around the world and data centers and things. Um, and sometimes data is just literally too big to move between them. But more often, there's just legal reasons you can't. You can't move healthcare data. You can't move financial data. All these things. And sometimes companies just don't want you to move the data, for that matter. Uh, so how do you then run analytics on, those that, on that data when you actually want to get it from lots of different places um, and have it be consistent, but not move it around. So thinking about how you run large, super distributed analytics, not just like the distributed kind of stuff we think about in HPC or paralyzing, but across data centers around the world, um, and get results from them that you could move up, both from size and legal reasons, redo, do more analytics on it and push the results back, and maybe even do iterations back and forth. Um, it's a very interesting challenge because it's much more about how you manage computation when it's running in separate strings um, that you have to think about when you're going to go back and forth uh, with you know, scale far beyond a, a single data center, which we're pretty good at doing within data centers. We aren't so good at doing it at this level. Um, I mentioned data curation is the other challenge. Um, the example that was given uh, in the previous talk is a good one. Uh, this is all sorts of different data you might want to use for agriculture, for example. You could have road data for shipping. You could have the land data, the weather data. Some of this is stagnant data. The land data doesn't change that often. The road data doesn't change that often. The weather data changes constantly. Combining these things together in a way that you could quickly make analyses is extremely complicated right now. Uh, we, we estimate we spend, even in just normal commercial endeavors, 80% of our time just cleaning up the data in one of these engagements, and then 20% of the time doing the interesting work to actually see if there's an insight there. Um, so what we're spending time now on at the research level is how do we do with data what we've been very effective at doing um, with uh, software, which is building up stacks of abstraction. You know, in, in software, you've got all sorts of levels of operating systems and middleware and applications and, and things that abstract the problem up so that when the data scientist or the person working on the problem is working on the algorithms, they don't have to worry about a lot of the gunk down below. We are not nearly as good at doing that with data. We, we really feel there needs to be kind of a, a middleware of data lets me call data with standard APIs and things that make it so I don't have to know what the data looks like underneath. I just know I'm looking for location, and it'll figure out what I, need, what I mean by that so I can combine it together with other things. Again, a very big problem, not something that's easily solved, but something we're spending a lot of time on, on the research end on. Um, and lastly, you know, I mentioned the problem that the data is increasing at the edge, and these are just some interesting statistics. 90% of the data created over the last 10 years was never actually captured or analyzed. That is, I mean, it just was created somewhere video cameras, sensors, whatever, but no one even bothered to capture it. Uh, part of it is because we literally are creating data at twice the rate we're creating bandwidth. So forget about whether we have the storage space for it. We couldn't even get it up there if we wanted to, because there's just not enough bandwidth being created at a time. Um, of course, at the same time, 60% of the valuable, valuable sensory data actually loses its value in milliseconds. It, if you don't do something with it right away, it doesn't really matter later on. Uh, so how do you deal with something at the edge in those sorts of t latencies? You probably aren't going to take it to the cloud and back. Um, the one interesting point that gives you hope, uh, by 2017, so this year, um, the, the estimate is the collective computing power and storage capacity of all the smartphones around the world will surpass that of all the worldwide servers in the data centers. So if I could somehow link all of our devices into a giant cloud, we would actually have more compute and storage capacity around the world than we did in all the data centers. Now, now we can't do that, fortunately, I think, in general. I don't actually want my cell phone to be part of your cloud. Uh, but it tells you the amount of compute power and things at the edge is increasing. So there is hope you can actually do things out there at the edge um, that, that are meaningful, rather than thinking you're going to move all the edge data up into a cloud. 
Um, so just you know, examples, I think, are pretty clear for edge data. Automotive, huge amount of data already being created. Um, Self-driving cars, of course, are uh, uh, increasingly interesting. Um, but you've got to act on some of this data very, very quickly. You know, 200 milliseconds to make the decision whether or not to stop because a pedestrian just walked in front of your car. You know, it doesn't matter if the cloud figures that out 10 seconds later. It's, it's too late. You know, you've got to do it there. Um, similarly, if you think about um, your mobile phone, you've got a lot of sensors on your mobile phone, it turns out, right? I mean, tons of things there you could do. Horribly battery constrained. Most of us do just barely get through the day with our phones without having to recharge them as it is, much less if I was trying to do complicated image recognition and voice recognition on my phone, which is why there's that you know, annoying pause where I'll ask Siri to go up to the cloud and hear what you're saying and send it back to you. Um, that would be something that would be really great if you could actually do it right on the phone instead. Um, or even something like a security camera where you have power. So that's not the problem. The problem is right now, most security cameras go back and just get stored somewhere in a big DVR. And if a crime occurs, then you go back and look at the security camera to figure out what happened after the fact. And if you discover that you did remember to record and it didn't get erased or something along the way, you're already a day or two later before you're actually doing anything with it. Um, and again, even if you were to send all those video streams back to some poor guy sitting in the back room trying to watch every camera for every aisle in Walmart, the chances that they're going to see that and see what's happening is, is pretty limited. On the other hand, if the camera itself could say, hey, there's something weird going on in aisle 14, look at this picture right now and send just that picture back to the security guy. Or an ATM, you know, the guy who just put this card in, that face doesn't match the face of the person who that, that card belongs to and send that back to the bank right then. Suddenly you have an instant case of doing it, but the camera's got to figure that out because you don't want to send it all back. You couldn't possibly have anybody looking at it in time. So the, I think the good news in general on this, and we've already heard this from, I know you've heard this from some of the previous speakers, is you know, neural nets and deep learning are getting very good at these sorts of recognition problems that we're talking about, the kinds of things the brain does well. So these are just some, uh, some data on image recognition and speech recognition. So the ability for a neural net to um, do image recognition or speech recognition compared to and what the error rate has been. You can see it was flat for a long period of time. Uh, you know, there was this huge drop around the, uh, 2010, 2011, that's basically when we reached enough compute power and had enough data that you could actually start training the neural nets to be meaningful. So the actual neural net structures and technology you know, is not that different than what people were doing in the 70s and 80s when, when neural nets first appeared. They just didn't have nearly enough data or compute power to actually train anything to do anything interesting. So suddenly, you, know, you can now identify cats on the internet because there are a lot of cats on the internet. So you can actually go train the whole system to know what a cat looks like. So you see these huge drops in error rates. And in fact, now for the best neural nets, um, systems are actually better than human error rate in many cases. So we actually have reached the point where you can say the image recognition on this and speech recognition on this for you know, the, the setup as it is, is actually as good or better than what a human could do. So that's really interesting, right? So that gives you a, a chance, a, a sense that we're getting somewhere. The, the challenge, though, is if you think about um, how much the architecture is hindering us, uh, it, it's the final limitation here. So, we actually did a, a simulation. The brain itself has about 120, 20, 100 trillion synapses, 100 billion neurons, um, consumes only 20 watts, as I pointed out earlier. Um, and that's just a giant neural net. So we went and tried to simulate that number of neurons and synapses. And we used the, the Livermore computer at the time. And so a big honking HPC system. And we did simulate that number. Now, I will be really clear. We in no way simulated a brain. These were the most unintelligent neurons you could possibly imagine. We were just trying to say, if you went and simulated this, could you just do a simulation that would involve this many neurons at once? Um, and it turns out you can. It required 8 million watts, so slightly more than 20 watts. 1.5 million processors were being used, and it was still 1,500x slower than real time. So still with all that power and stuff thrown at it, you were 1,500x slower than what the brain would do for doing any sort of, uh, any sort of work on it. And again, this wasn't even trained. It didn't even have any capability to do anything, really. But it was just interesting to see how much it took to do it. Um, and so we actually did the estimate. If you want to do real time, it's uh, one second real time, 12 billion watts. So you know, these are a couple good-sized cities we're talking about here for power. So you know, it, now obviously, you, you can argue you could do more efficient simulations. You'll find ways to do that. I think it's true, but we, that's a pretty big gap between 12 billion and 20. So I think it's, it's clear you're going to change some architecture before you're going to try and just fill that gap uh, this way. Um, so why is that? Well, it's because, of course, we have not designed our chips for this problem. Uh, we make cock frequency go up. Power density goes up and to the right. Power density is actually getting pretty high right now, so we've, of course, had a limit on terms of how fast things go. 
No one markets how fast their chip is anymore because it's not very interesting. It stopped you know, somewhere in the mid gigahertz range a while back. Um, but the reality is, of course, there's another direction to go, which is down and to the left, which is where the brain is, which is extremely low frequencies, um, but extremely low power. Um, and that you know, is, I think, arguably the direction you want to head if you're trying to do the things the brain does. And you're seeing lots of architectures now trying to play with this out there. I'm, and I'm going to talk about the IBM one, but there are other places out there too looking at how do you think about really building an architecture that looks like a neural net from the beginning. Um, so uh, we did build a chip called uh, True North. It uh, came out about two years ago. There's a big science paper on it. This is a, first of all, very clearly a standard silicon chip. It's 28 nanometer low power technology from Samsung. It's you know, normal technology. Um, it's 1 million neurons, digital neurons, um, 256 million synapses. Um, it only consumes 70 milliwatts, so an extremely low power type of device. Um, and, and these neurons are digital, they're spiking neurons, it's, so it's, it's called a spiking neural net. Um, but you can um, take many of the neural nets you've heard of today, the convolutional neural nets, uh, recursive neural nets, and you can map them onto this architecture. Um, and this is used strictly for inferencing. So you don't, we don't do the training on the chip. We do the training actually on, on large HPC systems uh, to go actually get the, uh, get the training done on it. But then once you have it, you load it on the chip and it operates at these very low power ranges. Well, that's really interesting because now you can suddenly start to do inferencing at very low power. So here's some examples uh, of this chip when it first came out. It was part of a DARPA project, uh, which was um, the goal was to see how low power you could get something that could do um, video tracking. Uh, so you might recognize that one scene. That was actually the camera on top of Hoover Tower here at Stanford. So a stationary camera uh, feeding in real-time three-color uh, HT video, 30 frames per second, um, and you had to track bicycles, pedestrians, and cars as they moved through. Um, and you, can't, you had to track them by literally in every frame identifying them again. So you couldn't just like you find one and then trace it along. Um, and that's doing that, and it's doing it um, for 70 milliwatts, although I, I will point out, so that, to do that large a frame was actually 16 of the chips because we could, had to take each frame out for it. But still, you do the math on that, it's only about two watts in the end it's using. And most of that two watts is actually the FPGA in front of it that's feeding in the signal from this camera into the chip because you have to get the signals into the chip itself. Uh, one on the, on, the, on the other side is actually the same problem, but now from a helicopter. So the background's now moving, so it's a little bit harder because you can't have a stable background behind it. I mean, you can imagine doing other things like identifying brand logos in, in uh, Twitter, which some of our clients might like to do, and uh, doing other sorts of images. You can also use it for voice recognition. Um, the, the spiking neural nets, the thing that's nice about them is it's just spikes to them. It's all just inputs coming in. doesn't care if it's visual or auditory. Um, so I think this is really interesting. While there are limitations to spiking neural nets, just showing you can get to this low a power. I mean, 70 milliwatts, you could have that on your phone, and it could be always on listening to you because that's your phone uh, is about two watts is probably what the uh, actual um, processor runs. So that actually opens up a whole new world of being able to do things in a mobile, in a mobile sense. Um, so uh, it, it actually won its competition at the time. It was about 100x better than any other implementations for, for inferencing. Um, so that means you could start to embed what we'd call cognitive agents into things. You can move stuff to the edge now that actually has, we call it cognitive, that's our good marketing term, but you know, basically has ability to do intelligence, AI kind of things. Uh, it can be a robot, of course, is the cool thing everyone thinks about, but it might just be an object um, that actually has some ability to actually interact and make decisions on its own rather than always going to the cloud. It could be a room or a space that you're interacting with um, that knows what you need Think elderly care, uh, for example, monitoring what's going on, but also being able to interact and, and ask the right questions to uh, uh, the patient along the way. Um, so I think it gives a whole new realm of ability. And so we th actually think these cognitive machines are not going to be just the big ones we build for the cloud, but increasingly going to be embedded into the IoT infrastructure itself. So it won't just be sensor works here, send to the cloud, make a decision, go back down but do some light cognition itself on the mobile devices. Enable rich sensory perceptions out there. Actually make decisions on the edge and only go to the cloud when there's a need for it, either because you need to go get information from somewhere else or it's something you actually want to store and keep track of uh, for later use um, or because it is just too large a, a problem now to solve on the edge. Um, so I, I think we, we believe we're heading into a sort of a new paradigm that will run going forward into new platforms. Obviously, mainframe is where we all started, client server. We're in the middle of cloud mobile right now, uh, you know, cloud centers and mobile for uh, access. 
we actually do think there's going to be a whole new plat set of platforms that really exist just on the edge, which tether in back to the cloud, of course, uh, long term, but really only in sort of the sense of the way you do maintenance or something. So you have that there, but you really are, in fact, working on the edges of the, of the, of the platforms themselves. Um, this can also be not just individual sensors, but think about creating, you know, uh, taking all the soldiers' um, phones and electronics when they're on a battlefield to create an ad hoc cloud right there to be able to do computations and things you can't do today in environments where you can't possibly get an actual data center or cloud in there and probably don't want to communicate that way anyway. So, um, like all of the platforms, just because this one's emerging, we aren't saying the others are disappearing. You know, we actually still make a really good business on mainframes, for example, despite the fact every newspaper said they died in the 90s. It turns out they actually are quite profitable, so we're, we're happy with them. Um, so all these things will continue. HPC in particular will continue. As I mentioned, you know, we expect to continue to build larger and larger HPC systems or HPC-like systems for training. Um, these, to get the really low powers for inferencing, you just want to do inferencing on the chip. Uh, you don't want to have, uh, to have be learning all the time. Not only because it takes too much power, but you, know, you don't want your self-driving car, for example, learning while it's driving. You want it to be, once it's on there, very predictable, very much the same, everything going to happen without any change. If something goes wrong, then you might want to retrain the neural net. Let's do that in a controlled fashion and push down a new version. Don't just let it learn as it's going. Um, interesting, though, I think will be the lower power. Um, We've already, I, we've already had talks about the platforms. You know, we have a Power AI platform with NVIDIA that we're using as well for doing training on it. Um, the interesting thing is actually, though, we do think about taking these systems, even these, these inferencing systems, and building them up into very large HPC-like systems um, to do very large inferencing problems. Um, so you know, I, back to the 100 trillion synapses for the brain, well, if, if we do, were to do this with this chip that we built so far, it would be about 400 kilowatts, which is still worse than the 20 watts we've got, but it's far better than 12 billion, and we're heading in the right direction at least. Um, so thinking about the scalability of this, in fact, we do uh, do a lot of work with um, Lawrence Berkeley, Lawrence Livermore, uh, Air Force Research Lab, and some of them now have 16-chip um, and 64-chip boards to actually think about building larger neural nets for doing these sorts of inferencing. So I can really see actually a parallel path for HPC as we think of it today and neural HPC or neuromorphic HPC where you think about building up really large systems for building giant neural nets for doing uh, really large scale problems or just large scale numbers of feeds coming in. Uh, the other way I think that um, HPC and, and this cognitive systems kind of come together is in, in back into the discovery space. So I, I talked about helping people find new drug molecules or materials um, and I talked about really from on the bottom, so helping having a system that can read the papers and patents much better than a person can, or, or at least a larger scale, get that information into them. Of course, we already do a lot of simulation in that space, right? To do drug molecules, protein folding. We use HPC systems to do all sorts of interesting simulations there. So if you could combine those two things together, so you know, you're getting information and such from uh, the literature at much larger scales, which allow you to come up with interesting ideas for different simulations and narrow down which simulations are the most important to do, do variations on the simulation side, which may lead you to different structures that, than what you saw, going back and taking those structures and figuring out, well, has anybody ever played with a chemical that looks like that structure before? Going through the whole literature again to see how that fits together. You can start to see a really interesting match between those two, those two areas. Um, and it does something that a human researcher right now can't do very well themselves, right? They can't do all the calculations and do all the literature searching and have all the domain knowledge in one place. This is a way to actually enable them to do this uh, much more effectively in the future. So this is sort of where we see all the cognitive and data side going. Um, and that, I think, gets us to a space with computing that looks a lot more like what we can do with our brains and starts to encroach more in terms of enabling us uh, to expand that side beyond just the computation side. Um, but there's a whole other realm of work that even our HPC systems and things can't do very well in simulation, nor can a cognitive system, a fuzzy system, do it. And that has to do with things that are more quantum in nature. And there's a famous quote um, from Feynman uh, back in like the 80s, nature isn't classical, damn it. And if you want to make a simulation of nature, you better make a quantum simulation. Um, and of course, I think we all know this is the case 
When you try and simulate molecules today, you know, a few atoms is pretty tough if you want to put in all of the interactions that really go on between the atoms. So, so we don't, of course. We do all sorts of um, simplifications um, and things. Many body problems come down to single particle problems and such to be able to make them tractable. But what if you really wanted to actually compute exactly the bond lengths in a, in a, in a fairly complex chemical? Actually, we can't even do chemicals today that are more than a few atoms. I mean, what if you want to do a, a large one? Um, well, you can't do it very easily with the HPC, and you can prove yourself out pretty quickly that you'll never be able to reach it just because of the sheer number of, of different quantum mechanical uh, configurations that go on. But if you had a quantum computer that where the qubits themselves were quantum in nature, you could think about doing these sorts of simulations. So, so just to remind people um, you know, what, what I mean by a quantum system, uh, obviously today we use bits. A bit is a one or a zero. Um, instead, in the quantum world, uh, you use something called a qubit which takes advantage of the fact that um, any, any entity, but any quant, uh, small entity in particular, um, is always in a superposition of states uh, until you actually measure it. So uh, a, a qubit can be not just a one or a zero, but in some um, superposition of multiple ones and zero states. When you measure it, it will give you a one or a zero every time. But whether it gives you a one or a zero is dependent on what state it was actually in at that moment when you went to measure it. So it's very fragile. You can't go measure it until you want the answer. But it allows you then to have, um, do, in a sense, multiple calculations at once. Um, if you think about it in sort of the most simplistic sense, if you're trying to find a prime number, which of course is what people talk about with quantum computing and breaking cryptography, you know, right now you just do large numbers of divisions over and over and over again to find all the factors that might go into that. Um, so if you think of it instead, if I took the string that was going to be, let's say, a million bits long, and instead of you know, trying to do a million, to, you know, do, do all of those over and over into the divisions, had every combination of one and zero in a superposition there, did one division where I was literally doing every bit with every possible one and zero combination at one time, suddenly that becomes a much simpler problem to do. So even something simple you can think about, 32 bits, uh, 30, 0 to 32, 5 bits, instead of doing 32 divisions to try which ones are actual factors, if I did all 5 bits at once and they were all 1s and 0 combinations at the same time and only the ones that actually, fe actually fit fell out, I've just done in one step what would have taken me 32 steps to do. So that's what people think about for quantum computing. But the other thing about it is if I just had qubits represent the quantum states of an electron or an atom or the uh, combinations of those together, you can suddenly do quantum chemistry much more directly. So you would just have qubits that represent electrons and qubits that represent the, the nuclear cores. And you can actually then go and do the computations the same way nature basically does it, right? When the electrons from two atoms get together, they don't do a bunch of calculations and simulations to figure out how they're supposed to work their energy levels together. They just, in a sense, try all of them all at once and get the one that fits. So you could do exactly the same thing then with a quantum computer. I think that's one of the things that's made quantum computing suddenly more interesting again, uh, at least for those of us uh, on, the, on the business side of the world, is it's not just about cryptography and whether or not we're going to, you know, the internet's going to go down because we're going to have all our codes broken, uh, but it turns out there are many other things you can go and do with it um, that you just literally can't do uh, at any point with classical simulations. And these are just some examples uh, of the types of problems that quantum computing can handle much more directly than, um, than a, a standard classical computer can do. Um, so to create a qubit, the, the challenge has always been how do you create um, a qubit itself so that you have something that can be put in a quantum mechanical state. Uh, the way we're approaching it is something called a Josephson junction, which is shown down at the bottom. It's a superconducting uh, material that forms a loop. We have a small barrier um, that's a, a tunneling barrier. You can, if you want to think about it sort of conceptually, you can have current flowing one direction or the other direction, and then one direction would be a one, the other direction would be a zero. That would be how you do your one and zero in a classical sense. But because it's a quantum, in a quantum state, it can be in a superposition of currents flowing in different directions at the same time. And as long as you keep it stable until you measure it, it will be, it'll actually be able to do those, these sorts of calculations that we're talking about. So we are able to then build these things and we control them using basically microwave frequencies. Uh, uh, as you guess, because you can't disturb it with anything, we keep it very, very cold. This is a refrigerator that's down in the 15 millikelvin range. Um, right now, so I, this one I will guarantee will not exist on the edge anytime soon. It will not be in your cell phone. Um, but it's, it is interesting because we can control this now. Um, and in fact, we actually, if you're interested, put out on the, the web in the, on May 4th of this year, or last year, um, the world's first five qubit 
uh, quantum computer. And you can actually go on, and there's a, a graphical interface on it. You can go in and put in your experiment on it. You can run it just in the simulator mode, or it will actually queue it up and run it on the, the, that system actually sitting in Yorktown Heights, New York, it'll run it on the system uh, there. We've had a huge number of people go and use this. I gotta say, I, we were amazed. I, we were all amazed we put this thing out there. We made a big deal about it, of course, and the press actually picked up on it quite a bit. But we were amazed how many people actually have gone and run things on this. I mean, that's, that number of people even knows what a quantum computer is and how to use it is amazing in itself. Um, but it's, it's interesting that the interest at level that's, been, that's come from this. Um, there's a whole community about it. Actually, if you're interested, you can go and take a look at it. But there have been some PhD theses already done with this because there have been people who have all this theory work going on. They could finally actually test, um, work on various papers along the way. Um, and it's interesting because this, I think, shows, too, when you go from actually just getting even basic capability can make such a difference in our ability to move forward in science uh, and research in general. This is only a five qubit machine. So a five qubit machine your internet is safe. You got, you got nothing to worry about here. Um, but it's, it's interesting, even with that, you can do some interesting stuff. In fact, we're about to put a paper out on the archive, probably about a month, where we actually used it for the first time to compute the bond length of, um, of a, a very simple a molecule, just a couple, couple atom molecule. And it's interesting because it shows that you can do it. Now, that's when you could certainly go simulate an HPC. It's not, nothing that complicated, but it proves the concept. Using the quantum computer, you can go do it even just with five qubits. Um, so you can go and do the math and see how this could grow in the future. Um, so it's interesting because there will be a Moore's law of qubits, just like there was uh, for computation. But the interesting thing is that because um, you're growing now exponentially, it's always two to the n you're getting for the n you're putting in there rather than just n. So instead of having to go from, say, you know, four kilobytes, you know, when the first TRS-80s came out, up to get into gigabytes before it became interesting, you know, we're right now somewhere less than 10. By the time we get to a, about 100 qubits, you'll already be able to simulate things that are too big to simulate on any classical HPC system. So that's not that big. Right? That's a factor of 10 we're talking about to get there. Um, and then if you get up to the millions of qubits that are really fully fault tolerant, and that's, I'm not going through the details of that, error correction is a huge issue for quantum computers, as you might imagine, because they're all in these weird superposition states. But when you get there, then you can do factoring of big data, drug discovery, machine learning, all sorts of things that we just could never imagine doing today. Um, so although millions is big, it's again, you think about Moore's law, how, how, how big we got there, this is not anywhere out of the question uh, in, in, within our lifetime. I think it's all coming much faster than what, uh, than what we even expected internally when it came out. Um, so anyway, I encourage you to think about quantum computers as well when you get a chance, go out and check it out on the web. Um, but that really wraps up what I wanted to say. I think when we look at the next era of computing, it, it really is about um, thinking about how you deal with data and how that's changing the way we not only build our systems, but how we even approach the idea of computing, pulling in more of the industry side and expertise from the beginning, the domain expertise for building these, these solutions. Um, and then as you think about the architectures below them, how to build architectures that really are right for those kinds of problems, whether it's a cognitive neural net problem or a quantum problem. And we really do think it's gonna require us, you know, the vertical integration we have in our research lab and the reason we've maintained it, despite the fact that you know, IBM itself, most of our revenue comes from services and software these days. It's not like we're, we make a lot of revenue on, we make no revenue on chips anymore. We do build systems still. But we still do all the device work, the systems work, because in order to build these future systems, we think that's gonna be really important. So having all those technologies together uh, in one spot is, continues to be an advantage, we believe. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, so the, the question is the neural net chip versus like an Intel chip or something like that. So it, it's, it's completely different architecture in that it's, it's not clocked at all. Each neuron is basically uh, just a very small unit that has a bit of SRAM on it. And its only function is it gets 256 inputs that come in. It's all event driven. An input comes in. It looks at that input and decides, do I fire or do I not fire? Just like a neuron would do, right? The input comes in. It looks at what its state is of its, of its connections. If it says, I'm going to fire, all it does is send out a signal to every neuron it's connected to on the other side to say, I fired. <laughs> That's all it does. So it's literally the amount of data you're moving is, is negligible. There's no memory in it. There's nothing that you're storing other than the state of the neuron itself and this little bit of SRAM. So most of the time, it's just sitting there doing nothing except when it's running information back and forth uh, to actually do things, which is very much the way your brain operates, right? Your, your neurons just sit there. All they're waiting for is enough inputs to come in to say, oh, I'm going to fire now. Um, but it turns out, although that's, in some ways, back to the, the point that Julie was making about the um, precision, this is a one-bit precision, right? That's it. You're either firing or you're not firing on this stuff. 
Um, and it's, it's interesting, you can emulate, we've gotten you know, state-of-the-art scores on a lot of the image tests using this, this system, but at these very low powers. Um, now it has its limitations. The next version of the architecture we're gonna do is actually not gonna be just one bit precision. We're gonna go to a few more bits. Turns out there are some advantages you can get in area if you do that. But this idea of saying, look, the system should just sit there and, and fire neuro neurons back and forth, we believe is the right way to get the power down, rather than trying to have a clocking system that's doing a lot of calculations. That makes sense. In terms of getting 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 down, so you Yeah, it's interesting. A uh, good question. How is that going to change what we do with HPC? <clears throat> I think. <clears throat> excuse me. I think if um, if we're capable of getting a lot of these technologies out there to the edge that can do this sort of um, uh, acceleration of image recognition and things, taking some of those cores back in and building up large systems clearly could have an impact. <clears throat> I'm sorry. The um, other thing though, that we've uh, been working on with one of the uh, <clears throat> energy labs is. Uh, when you run a big HPC system today, you obviously do a lot of work to make sure that you aren't getting hot spots, that your workload's being well distributed and such. And you do your best to get that right, but then you all, sometimes the calculations go awry and you find out you've got something that's really a bottleneck that you hadn't anticipated in the problem. Um, they're actually looking at, could you take neural net systems to look at that system while it's running and predict when you're about to get a bottleneck, just based on the behavior that's out there. So I think there'll be an interaction that goes on there as well between you know, the sort of more fuzzy stuff that we're thinking about doing at the edge of the system, bring it back and actually observe what we do on the more, uh, say, accurate side when you're doing HPC calculations. Um, I don't know that I really see us doing HPC distributed across the edge. Um, you know, I talked about the edge clouds, but I see those as being much more for communication and for, uh, uh, I'd say, more fuzzy cognitive workloads rather than actually using it to, to do an HPC style calculation anyway, at least at this point, I would think. Thanks. No, you actually hit on something that's really important, and we found this in the, in the systems design on this. Um, so like when we're using the, the uh, Synapse chip for um, uh, this image recognition, we actually have partnered with a, a company in Zurich that has a, a retinal camera. And the camera, what it does, actually, it, it works more like your retina. It doesn't take pictures. It just, it only fires when it gets a photon. Every time a photon comes in, it just says, oh, I, I picked one up, and sends it to you, just the way your retina works, right? So it's doing exactly that. It's not bothering to send, if something's not changing, if, you, if everyone's sitting still in the room and the camera's sitting here, it's, I get no outputs from it. As soon as somebody moves, I get outputs just from what's moving in the frame and sends only that information to the chip. So the camera itself is remarkably efficient because it's using very little power. It only uses it to see changes that are happening. And of course, then the information it's sending back for computation is only the information I actually need. I don't need to see what the picture looks like all the time. I just need to see the change in the picture. So I think you know, that's a first step, but I think we're constantly trying to figure out how could you continue to quickly get rid of the information you don't need for the current task um, and focus just on the stuff that is there, because that's, again, a way to get the power down. So I, the, yeah, so I guess the question is, is there a theoretical you know, framework or link that goes, says, you know, this is what you use a CPU or a GPU or FPGA for, this is good for neural nets, this is good for qubits, this is how they, how in theory they should be utilized. Is that, is that what you're asking? Right. 
Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so how does it matter? I, I, would, I would say that the von Neumann mar model wraps very poorly to any of the others, uh, the, either to qubits or to what we're doing right now with, uh, with neural nets that are sort of um, uh, being done uh, natively, a structure like the spiking neural net, in that we don't, we don't have you know, a memory um, and a data stream and a, and a compute stream is separate that we're using that to go back and forth on it. In most cases, um, the entire function is just processing data. So just as data comes in, it processes what it is. So the spiking neural, that's a good example. All it's doing, it's got no instructions other than you send an input in, it gets a spike in, it looks at that and sends a spike out. And that's all it's doing. There's no program, it has no sense of program, it has no sense of what the other neurons around it are doing. It just knows when things come in, it sends stuff out. Um, and, and in quantum computing, it's, it's fairly similar. You set up the problem, which is incredibly complicated. But once you set the problem up, then you're just letting it go through quantum mechanical um, uh, fluctuations until it gets to the answer you're looking for. Um, so it's, there is some work on the universal quantum computer side where we are starting to, well, we have classified a series of gates, quantum gates where you can say this is now a universally compute, a complete machine, like a Turing machine. So you can prove it with these five gates, you can do every possible, um, you know, it's logically complete, you can do every possible calculation. But like a Turing machine, it's, it's, it would be incredibly inefficient to, to do it that way, really. So you may use it for some problems or some portions of problems, but the really power of it comes when you don't bother to try to do it in that sort of logical sequence, the way we, we would do it in a von Neumann machine. <laughs> yeah. If they only wrong once in a hundred years, uh -huh. why you say, yeah, okay, they might be wrong with this diagnose? Right. Right. I, I, for one, welcome my robot overlords at any moment. But <laughs> no, the, uh, I think it's this question on AI actually came up this morning. I was over in the, the medical school. We were talking about some bioinformatics and the radiological assistant. We were talking about with the radiologists. Um, and, you know, the initial fear is it's going to take my job. And, and, you know, quite honestly, all these things are going to take a lot of our jobs going forward. I mean, it's a, our ability to automate is, is becoming more and more capable. But really, that's not like it's going to happen next year. I mean, w this radiological assistant will augment their capabilities as radiologists at least for the next several decades, right? Because we are not good enough at understanding all the nuances of what a human does in that, in that space to really replace it. But what they brought up there, and what you're bringing up here, was that's probably true. But if the system's getting really good at getting the answers, aren't I going to become dumber? Am I going to become less able to learn the stuff myself and understand and, and then make those calls? And I think it's a very, a very valid concern. I mean, you think about when you drive around, when I go to a new city now, I have my GPS and my phone, right? Um, I almost never get a visual image of what the streets are laid out in that city anymore, the way I used to. When I used to have to go and really understand where I was going to be walking and what I was going to do, I just follow the GPS. And you know, I, could, I leave, and I literally have no picture in my mind of what that city looked like. I just remember the buildings I was at. Right? And that's, that's already a change. It's happened just in the last 10 years. So I think there's no question this is going to change how we think and what we spend our time finding important. In some cases, it's going to be good. It takes cognitive load off our, our brains to go do other things that we hopefully find more interesting and more, and, and more creative and more fruitful. But there's a slippery slope. You know, at some point, that might be a problem. I mean, none of us can spell anymore. That, that, that was gone uh, several years ago. So I think this is all going along. Uh, so I think it's something we have. We are part of a group, um, uh, AI and Ethics, uh, which was created. It's, you know, it's us, Intel, um, Amazon, Google, I mean, all, all the players involved with it. And, and we set it up about a year ago, largely originally because of the public concern about artificial intelligence, and, which is, I have to say, I believe, way overrated. I, we are far from doing things that they think we can do. I, I'd like to be able to do some of the things they think we can do. Um, but I think there are, a lot of, there are a lot of ethical questions that come up, and not just ethical, but then societal questions and what is the right way to use this technology, and what does that mean about the way we're going to develop as a society that I think it's good to start thinking about now before you know, we find we're down a slippery slope that we hadn't realized. Yep. You are like kind of like, you know, a uh, chip. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I ask you, you know, how likely or how fast I mean, I can you uh, develop and use that kind of a human like of a chip and to surpass like, you know, GPU or, mm. you know, how soon that uh, quantum computing, you know, can surpass 
Right. So um, on the so the quantum computing uh, is is an interesting one because it's it's not just suppress GPU. It, it, the thing with the quantum computer is for the right for the right problem, and it's and it's a small subset of problems. It will just do things that, that no classical system can ever do. By the time we get to about 100 qubits, we'll be there. We're, we're right now less than 10. So you know, as an industry, not just us, but you know, as an industry, less than 10. But I would say you know, we're talking within the next five to 10 years, we'll be at a range where we can do simulations and things in chemistry that are beyond what you could do with any HPC system, any GPU system, FPGA system. Just any classical cal calculation could never reach that. Now, the other question, though, on the neural net, I think is it's actually it's sort of um, it's sort of apples and oranges. Um, I use GPUs constantly for training, and I, and I think that for training and for doing that, it's, it's, uh, they will continue to be, I mean, I'm sure we'll change the GPU structures, and we already saw you know, NVIDIA continues to do things to optimize them for this field. I think that'll continue. Um, and for training, you need to have tons of data. You're gonna probably do it at a data center anyway, so you will have power available, and just the sheer speed you need and, and, and amount of computation, I think will continue down that path. We're focusing the neural net chips on when I want to go inference it now. So I have a trained neural net that I've trained probably on a large GPU system. I've downloaded that onto this chip. I want that chip to be able to operate in your phone or out in the, in the world and do inferencing for very, very low power. It's not learning anymore. It's not doing anything. In fact, actually, one of the things we did, we have looked into is, so let's suppose it, it's doing what it's doing, it's doing what it's doing, and it's like a self-driving car. So it's going along, everything's going fine, and suddenly the driver grabs the wheel and turns left. Um, that moment, we'd actually like to capture everything that happened just before and after that, send that up to the cloud, and decide why did the driver do that, right? Because then I might want to reteach the chip, I might want to reteach the neural net that it's, it's done something wrong, or it might be the driver just changed his or her mind, in which case that's fine too. But anytime we want to do that kind of learning from the field, I think we'll still send it to the cloud, do the learning in a more controlled environment, and then send the resulting neural net when we're confident that, that it's been improved back down to the chip. Um, so I think GPUs, FPGAs, the whole HPC infrastructure we're going to continue to use, um, even if we get neural net chips going out. Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. <laughs>